Show of hands in the room. How, what kind of audience do we have here? Are we pre-revenue? Anyone pre-revenue? No shame, by the way. Uh, anyone between like, um, like 1K and 10K MRR? All right, anyone 10K to 100? All right, so that's, that's okay, that's the big majority here. Uh, congratulations, everybody. Like, it's super hard to grow a startup. Um, I, uh, I know this because I remember <laughs> crying into a lunchbox uh, in front of my wife and kid. Before I was the head of growth at Powered by Search, I also was a founder, uh, and we started in 2015 a survey tool, a live survey tool for events like this, uh, where you'd vote uh, with your phone, and it would go on the screen, you'd see the results coming in. We raised a small bit of money, so small that when I told Rob that I'd raised money, and I, was it okay that I still spoke at MicroConf, he said, that was so small that it was basically not raising money. Uh, so. I'm qualified, guys, all right? Uh, we raised money, we had investors on our board. Um, it, was, it was so weird. We grew this company. It, didn't, it never really took off. And we felt like it was just rough going. And I remember this one point, I was standing in my living room, uh, just about to leave the house. My wife came downstairs with our newborn, uh, our first kid, in her arms. Uh, and she said to me, are you OK? Uh, and I literally just went <laughs> I was crying into this lunchbox full of sandwiches. Sandwiches, if you will. Uh, <laughs> and I really felt like uh, the whole time that I was growing this company, we hit challenges with scaling. Every single day felt like treacle or molasses or whatever you call it in your language. We're a global audience here. Every growth gain that we made, going up like this, ended up getting churned out somewhere else. It was an absolute nightmare. And really, this slide for me is, is what startup life is like, right? Nothing really worked. I went from oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, we're going to smash this. 15 minutes later, I am going to have a heart attack. I am so stressed, <laughs> right? And uh, I think probably by the chuckles, some of you can identify with that. You probably feel like this too, for a, to a certain extent. You got into building a startup because you loved creating stuff. You wanted to build a business. You were excited about solving a problem for your customers. But often the growth is stagnant, right? I think we all face that. Uh, speaking to everyone at the drinks last night, I think there were a lot of people who identify with this. Nothing that you do works reliably. You're convinced the next thing will be the thing that's going to take you to the moon, but it's not. And you're wondering how long to keep at it. It's like you're waiting for a bus to turn up. You're standing by the bus stop. It's already late, and you're thinking, should I wait this extra minute? Will it arrive if I'm walking down the street away from the bus stop? That's what growing a SaaS company feels like a lot of the time. You don't know when the bus is going to arrive that's going to take you to where you want to go. But maybe you give it just one more chance, right? So as I said, I left my startup eventually. I was tired. I was burned out. Uh, and I thought, I love helping people grow companies. I enjoyed this. Uh, this was fun, even though it was painful. Um, and so I went and I joined Powered by Search. Powered by Search is one of the world's leading uh, SaaS marketing agencies. We literally only do B2B SaaS. And all that we do is we build sustainable systems to help people scale their trials and demos, their revenue, effectively. When I arrived and I, I saw that we were generating results like this, and I appreciate some of you might feel a little uh, squinty while you're looking at those, sorry about that, uh, I was like, oh my gosh, like we've cracked it. And so here's my question to you. What would you do uh, with your time if you could just solve customer acquisition? Like if you did nothing else in the next three months except crushed customer acquisition, what would you do in month four? Does it sound pretty good? Hands up. A few 
to get customer acquisition sorted so that you're just scaling revenue? No hands went up. I'm worried for you guys. <laughs> we just like building. Um, right? If you, if you could do that, are you willing to invest the time is the question that you have to ask yourself. Because it's going to take you time. Hopefully the answer is yes. The trick is, there are only three ways to actually grow a SaaS company. And it's this. The first way that you can do it is you can increase QPC. QPC, you can call it whatever you want. I call it quality pipeline contribution. That means the number of deals, trials, demos, going through the pipeline at any one time. You can increase that. The second thing that you can do to grow reliably is decrease your CAC. You hear about this all the time. Everyone's like, just cut your CAC. It'll be easy, man. It's not, but you can do it. And that's the second way that you grow a SaaS company. And then the third way that you grow a SaaS company is to increase your lifetime value. How much and how long your customers pay you for. Increase that. Just do it. The question really is how, right? Uh, there are three things that you have to do in order to do this. The first one is you have to focus on attracting the right fit customers at the right pace. In your industry, whatever your market is, whatever your segment of the market is, there are people who are good. They know what they're doing. They've attracted the right fit customers. Everybody thinks if they want to buy a sales, uh, a sales recording tool, they think of Gong. Or they think of uh, HubSpot in the CRM market, right? Those people are dominant. Wouldn't it be great if you were those people? We're talking big, big playing here. But in every niche, there is also big players. The second way that you can do this is by increasing engagement. So when we're talking about engagement, we're removing friction from the mind of your customer, your ideal customer. So someone lands on your website, we want to remove as much friction in the decision to try your product as possible. Or if they see your ads, or if they see you on social or in communities, how can you remove as much friction from their mind of like, what is this tool? To get to a place where they're like, oh yeah, I know what that is, I want that. That's number two. And then the third way is you can improve conversion. Now we're not talking about improving uh, conversion in the sense of like form fields, that kind of thing. This isn't CRO, right? What we're talking about is improving conversion in the sense that a customer goes from I'll try this out for a period of time to I'm going to use this. This is going to be a main part of my business, and I'm going to use it for a long period of time. The challenge, though, is not just moving one of those at the same time, but it's moving multiple levers at once. Companies that can move multiple of those at the same time grow significantly faster than companies that just move one. And that's the end. Thanks for coming to my talk. <laughs> well, it, it's, uh, it would be depressing for you if you paid to come and see a talk, right? And that was the end. Um, but look, let's do this more practically. I'm going to have a piece of paper in front of them. Pick it up. We're going to do some, we're going to do some writing down as well. I'm going to ask you to make notes not to remember my presentation, but for your own benefit uh, here, we're going to do some scoring, OK? You don't have to share the scores with anyone, so just be totally honest. Uh, and if people here have teams, you should also do this with your teams later. We'll share the slides, and there'll be a recording of this presentation eventually as well, so you can show that to them. Now, um, there are nine levers that in this model. This is called the predictable growth model. Uh, this is the, um, the image that I talked about there. And we score everyone that we work with on each of those levers on a scale of one, being the worst in the market, got to be frank sometimes, to 10, being the best in market. You can do this with yourself. It's a self-score. And um, I'll give you some notes as we're going through to really help you with this. So remember, just keep making these notes, because it will be useful to you, I promise. 
Let's start with attraction and look at the levers. So you see around the outside here, we have a series of levers around attraction. So the goal here is to go from obscurity, no one knows who you are, to dominance. You're the first person that everyone thinks about when they think about buying a tool in your market. The first thing that we want to look at is create demand. And we ask a series of questions. The main question here is, how confident, and you should answer this on your piece of paper, write down create demand and then a score. How confident are you that you are intentionally attracting only qualified right fit traffic? Score of one, worst in the market, to 10, best in the market. Now, if you are not attracting the right people in the first place, there is no element of optimization that is really going to make a difference for you. You can't optimize zero. <laughs> it's zero, right? But if you can even get some good fit traffic, you can improve on that over time. How can you, how confident are you that you're attracting this? Now, what does this look like? This is the, this is the hardest slide you're going to see today because it's, it's a lot of text, but I'm going to walk you through it. This all starts with having a very clear picture of who your best customer is, your ICP, your ideal customer profile. With, with every uh, client that we work with, we want to get this level of detail for them. Um, actually, this is only a snapshot, but basically there are five things that you should think about with your ICP. What must be true for you to be successful about them? What is important? So which things don't have to be true, but they do tend to make better results for your customers, like if these customers fit in this category. What's nice to have? Good customers and great customers, right? You want the great ones, ideally, but you'd be happy with the good ones for the time being, but like, let's, shoot, let's aim for the stars. Amber flags. So this would be a situation where maybe they don't quite fit in, but you probably you need the revenue, right? Because we're all building companies. And maybe you'll accept them for the time being as a customer, but that's, that's not the long term. And then red flags would be uh, things that absolutely they're the wrong customer for you. Um, so for us, for example, we need a mission-critical product to work with, like the CRM. Like, that's where we thrive. Uh, the founder of, uh, or the VP of marketing or growth starts the conversation with us. That's pretty important, uh, but it's not necessary. Then, <laughs> uh, nice to have is that people already like us. That's pretty great. Uh, amber flags would be, for us, there's no marketing leader in post. Like, they don't have a marketing leader. And then red flag would be they hire competing agencies to do the same work. You would be amazed how often that happens. It is totally wild to me. Our ICP definition is actually about 30 points long. I promise you that if you get a very clear picture of your customer, your marketing will improve, your acquisition will improve just naturally. It will be a pulling force for you. Uh, the question is, where do you get this stuff from? The first uh, place is ad account insights. If you're running ads on any platform, you should be able to see things like seniority, job title, that sort of stuff, regions, all this kind of stuff. Particularly true on LinkedIn, which is a fantastic ad platform, although a little bit expensive if you get it wrong. Uh, then manual analysis would be, so this is all pre-sign up, like uh, manual analysis would be things like gut feel, uh, am I getting the right customers? Am I feeling good about them? Are they paying me? So stuff that is sort of intuition. Followers and fans would be stuff like, um, you know, are, are people who are engaging with me on social in the right market for me? That's a sign that your content is resonating with them. Sales uh, would be like, okay, in our sales calls, people are hitting all of our ICP definition. CDP level data, customer data platform. So. You'd be looking at something like Intercom or whatever you're using to see whether the attributes in, the, in each contact record are similar to your own. Uh, a CRM level data is obviously, if you've got a CRM, are the people in that CRM the right kind of people for you? And if you're hitting those things, 
that's great. You're going to do pretty well. You should be higher up on the 10. The next lever that you can pull, and I'm going to be breezy here. There's a heap that we can say, but I'll put in the Slack channel for MicroConf a heap of um, resources that allow you to go deeper where you want to after, so that will be useful, hopefully. Second question is build authority. Score yourself zero, uh, 1 to 10, so 1 worst in market, 10 best in market. This is to what degree is everyone on your team on the same page about the transformational promise that you make to your customers? What does that look like? Well, in reality, your team is telling different stories about what you're doing every single day. I can almost guarantee you that is the case. If you have people who aren't in your founding team, it's almost definitely the case. Even within your founding team, though. This, these are six things that I heard on a daily basis from our team when I was at DuPol. Uh, and they're so different. There's, like, there is no customer who cares about all of those or even a, a half of those. And it left me feeling like this because it really stalled our growth efforts. The challenge then is to align your team and everybody in it and have a clear picture about what you do. I use this framework, uh, which is just a simple positioning si uh, system. We actually have a, a much more in-depth one. Again, I'll link to it in the MicroConf uh, channel. But basically, I would, I would suggest this for you. Put into your team Slack or Basecamp or whatever messaging app you use this statement and say, hey, you guys mind just replying with what you think this is? This will be so interesting for you because you'll see where you're going wrong and where you're going right. Many customers, put your profile in here so you're filling in the gaps, pain point, what are we solving for them? And so our competitors do, how is your competitor solving this problem? But we think, and then your unique differentiated worldview, it's very important, it's one of the key factors in a growing company, is better so we and then our solution. That's your basic pitch. So think about this for HubSpot, for example. Um, I use them as an example because everyone knows them. Uh, many small business owners, that's the customer, don't have a reliable system for managing their acquisition of new customers, and so potential revenue falls through the cracks. That's the pain point. So our competitors provide them with a CRM to manage contacts and deals, competitor solution. But we think that this doesn't go far enough because they need tools for marketing automation and email and things like that. So uh, it's better so that we, our solution would be, that's why we provide them with a CRM that has built-in marketing automation tools, ad management, and email software. If your team can align on a single version of this, and say it consistently, they don't have to say it word for word, but the concept has to be pretty close, then you're doing well. And then finally in this section, we've got fill funnel. The question here is how robust is your system for turning visitors to your website into prospects that give you permission to have a deeper level of conversation with them? This is going to be incredibly important in the years to come as we move away from uh, third-party tracking to first-party data. Are you worst in the market or the best in the market for filling your funnel? One to ten. Give yourself a score. Um, most people, this is true of companies that are 100 million or even, or even 1 million, uh, they will be looking at the buyers in market. Uh, I can say this is true because this is true of many of the clients that we start working with. Um, they will be looking at the buyers in market and going, okay, how can I get those guys to convert right now? Well, look, you have a current addressable market, which is a section of your larger market, which you think you can probably target right now with the features that you have. And then you have a total addressable market, which is a much broader thing uh, and, and likely uh, a number so large that it's almost abstract to you at this point. You should still be marketing to at least the current addressable market in order to get permission to continue marketing to them, right? So they come onto your website, they browse 10 seconds. How are you getting those people into your system somehow so that you can continue to convert? Well, 
This is one way that we've done this, just an example. Uh, this is a company called Loxo. Um, I think they're going to be a big deal, but right now they're very small. Uh, and basically, they make um, a deal room for sales teams. So like, imagine you, you want to sell someone a product, and there's lots of stakeholders. They put all the documents in a same, single place. Now, um, what, we, what I help them do is uh, basically this concept called precursor marketing. So you might have seen templates for Zapier and things like that. Um, the template for Zapier is a great way to get someone to start using Zapier. But there's a challenge. Not everybody is ready to start using your product. They just want to solve a problem. So this, the, this is the current addressable market. Now, what we told Loxo to do was basically replicate their exact system in Notion uh, or some tool. Anything will work, really. A Google Doc would work. But replicate what you do and allow people to download or get access to it just for an email address. The challenge, though, is to remove certainty, speed, or insight. Okay? So you remove certainty of outcome from your actual product and put it into the uh, doc. You remove in a speed. Like, it's harder to do a Notion doc than it is to do one of Luxo's uh, projects. And you remove insight. There's no analytics in Notion, so you've removed the insight. Now, doing that stuff allows you to attract more people and get them into your system with something useful that they actually want to do. Uh, now we're on to engage. So uh, here the trick is to go from friction to flow. Okay? Um, the, 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 the goal is to get an increased quality of pipeline because people believe that you are the solution and you decrease your CAC because it's more obvious that people are actually going to convert. If I, I literally got um, a tattoo, by the way, of uh, target customer pain points uh, on my arm. Um, uh, <laughs> fortunately, it was a fake tattoo. Uh, but it was convincing enough that the internet believed me. Uh, so uh, I, I believe in this very deeply. How well engineered is the content on your website? If you have it, if you don't, you need it. To cause the prospect to know that you truly get them better than anyone else they're paying. And by the way, we're going into a crazy market, right? The economy is crashing. If you already think you're doing a good job of this, your customer's pain points are changing next year. You need to readdress it. Are you scored a 1 or a 10? Write that down on your paper. People are investing in software because it solves their problems. They don't wake up in the morning going, man, I want to buy a CRM today. <laughs> they go, I have a painful problem. I'm going to buy a CRM today. That specific phrasing is a crucial part of software buying. I have a problem. I'm going to solve it. You must be able to demonstrate how your product meaningfully solves deep pains. So again, here's another example uh, of a good and a bad. So bad, uh, there's a builder trend uh, competitor in here somewhere, I know. Um, so uh, they do this thing on their homepage where they say, we're the leader of construction management software. That's their selling point, the leader of construction management software. No one cares. We're changing the way the world builds. A, I don't believe you. <laughs> But B, no one cares. Build a trend, connects teams, improves project efficiency, and increases in profits. OK, maybe someone cares about that. But it's still not very specific. On the other hand, and yeah, sorry, I did this. This is literally my copy. So I'm going to praise myself here. This is great copy. Everything you need in a construction management tool. Builders, construction pre people, they don't care about software. They just want to solve their problem. They want everything that they need in a single tool. It's a common pain point. We learned this by speaking to ProGil's customers. They were fed up of buying multiple tools to manage their projects. This one is built by construction pros, people like us. They get us. And they have honest pricing. Because I kid you not, ProGil's customers said to me, we don't like build a trend because it's run by Wall Street. I was like, I cannot identify with that worldview. 
But if that is how you feel, then I am going to really respond to that. This converts like crazy uh, because it clearly targets pain points. And we actually have a framework that we caught, and again, this will be available, uh, <laughs> so you don't need to read it all. We have a framework that we call the SaaS Authority Architecture. It's effectively an architecture for information on your website that we have found to be ideal. It's not always right, but it is pretty great. Uh, and if I were you, and I was looking for actionable things to take away from this, I would be going away and making sure that I have those key conversion pages, their stars, very neatly responding to customer pain points, right? So that would be, just so in case you're squinting there, home page, the book a demo or trial page, and the competitor pages. Competitor pages absolutely crush acquisition, and they do it reliably. Everyone that I have done one of these for is absolutely nailing it. Uh, the reason is because they're deep, they make honest comparisons, and they're not afraid to send bad fit customers to alternatives. Keep that in mind. You don't need a pricing table on there. You don't need a feature comparison table. You don't need to nag your competitor just to get customers. You're a good product, right? You've got one. You've got a clear market. You're going to get customers if you just really respond to that. Educate, motivate prospects. How often do you publish content about mistakes your prospects are making in their industry instead of only talking about solutions that you provide? Everybody talks about solutions they provide. But are you the worst in the market, a one? Or are you the best in the market, a 10, at telling people how to solve their problems? Or at least offering them ways to do that? It isn't enough. It's a classic piece of marketing Twitter advice to talk about benefits, uh, not solutions. No one, no one can get what you're talking about. No one understands, oh, these guys are going to change my life. I'm definitely going to pay them $1,000 a month. <laughs> uh, right? You have to align features and benefits to your customers' pain points because you have to hold your prospect's hand through the process of buying most of the time. Um, I'll give you an example again from Dupol. So, uh, pain point content on your website will convert a significantly higher rate than high volume content. So, high volume content would be, in this case, it was literally <laughs> a piece responding to the keywords, uh, the query, uh, what are benefits of satisfied customers? Now, literally, no one in the world really needs that content. I bet if I asked you what are the benefits of custom, satisfied customers, you'd probably tell me the content of this article just two seconds. No one needs it. It's low value. But you do it to get the, key, the search traffic. It converted at less than 1%. On the other hand, this piece, which I considered, frankly, quite dumb uh, when I wrote it, create an online poll in under two minutes. I was like, no one, again, no one needs this. I was wrong. This became one of the highest converting pieces of content on our website. 20% of people who searched for that converted to paying customers. That is insane. It shouldn't happen, but it does. People sometimes buy software like that. But what it tells us is that content that actually aligns to pain points decreases the friction in the buying process because they're like, oh, I have a pain point. These people are telling me how to solve it and they have a piece of software that solves it. Done deal. I mean, it's not always that straightforward, but... Calibrate calls to action is our next lever. So how consistently, effectively, and successfully do your content marketing efforts contribute to demo and trial pipeline targets? Now, maybe you don't have demo and trial pipeline targets, but you've got growth figures that you have in mind. How successful are you doing that right now? One or 10? And this, by the way, call to actions is not just talking about buttons. We're talking about this. How are you getting permission from all of these people to continue marketing to them and building their awareness of your product and your way that your product solves their problem? You have a small number of buyers in market, but you have a much larger total addressable market, some of them don't know what their problem is. Hopefully, that's not the majority. If it is, you really need to think about this. 
Hopefully, most of them are problem, solution, or product aware. Now, many people will just neglect entirely to market to those people, but it's the majority of the market. Now, they're going to buy a product at some point, most likely, unless their needs change significantly, but that's a, that's a mathematical portion. How are you getting permission to do that? How does your content help in doing it? Buyers need a lot more hand-holding than you think that they do. Uh, I'm not saying buyers are stupid. We're all buyers of software. We just need more hand-holding than saying, I just want to buy this. We came up with this thing. We call it the buyer readiness matrix. It's basically different kinds of content that we have found to convert very well at different stages of the funnel. Convert being not I'm going to sign up, but I'm ready to move to the next phase of the content journey, right? So the buyer journey at so, uh, somehow. So I won't go through all of these, but like, let's say, for example, I am, uh, I'm solution aware. Uh, so I know that there are problems that, 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 that there are solutions that can solve my problem. Um, but let me quantify the cost of the problem. Well, a calculator there will give you a way to say, OK, here's how much the problem costs you. Right? That's a valuable piece of content. Now, if you make a great call to action after showing someone that piece of content, because they've said, I have that problem, you can also say to them, OK, well, here's some product-aware stuff. Right? You don't say, here's product-aware stuff. You say, here's a great case study of how X company solved the same problem as you did. That stuff, again, you're talking about just moving people along. And the final area, and I'm breezing through now, guys, uh, the final area of our uh, predictable growth model is convert. So how do you go from loose, loose kind of buyer relationships to locked in for a long period of time? The goal here is to increase lifetime value. And obviously, there is a relationship between, or hopefully, obviously, between lifetime value and the cost of acquisition. If you keep someone for longer and you pay them the same fixed amount, uh, you pay ad networks or whatever, the same fixed amount, obviously there's a relationship there. You're going to decrease CAC, and that's, that's one of the ways to grow. First lever you can pull here is stacking strategies. How robust is your system for connecting demand gen strategies, so acquisition strategies, that work together, so across all your channels, to increase deal flow? Are you one or are you ten? This is not a secret, but it feels like it sometimes. To reliably generate revenue and build an unstoppable SaaS company, channels must work together, marketing channels we're talking about there, to, uh, to be part of a broader strategy. Uh, a quick uh, idea of how that works is each, uh, each channel actually ends up creating a flywheel. So let's say you're investing in paid media, that's ads. Uh, for anyone not uh, familiar with that. Ads will allow you to buy perfect fit traffic as long as you know what you're targeting, in theory. Now, if you can drive those people to your website, demand gen, that's what we call positioning and messaging, so that will allow you to convert people better. Now, you can improve, uh, you can improve the cost per acquisition by publishing relevant content and get, getting people to, uh, to stay around longer because they're better fit customers, they know you solve their problem. This is a flywheel, and it feeds all back into each other, right? It just it will perpetuate, but you have to make it happen. Drive deal flow is the next lever. How well do you convert marketing qualified leads? That's people who've said, yeah, I want to know more information, or I'm, I kind of want to know more information, into sales ready. Uh, sales qualified leads, demos, and trials. So this is people who are ready to literally use a piece of software, but just need to go through a buying process. To drive deal flow, ask yourself this. What's the offer that I could make a prospect to get them to choose their next step right now? Like a choose your own adventure. Like what do I need to offer them at this point to create a compelling story for my prospect? There's a case study that we have. Um, Moving prospects through the buying process. Basically, we had this client in financial advisory software for client management, right? It's pretty technical. But basically, financial advisors want more assets under management, uh, and that's how their business grows. They get more people investing their money with them. 
uh, we had this lead magnet there, and basically, um, when they started working with us, they, the people were just languishing in their pipeline. They didn't really want to reach out. They didn't really want to do anything. They just wanted this one resource. Um, and so basically what we did uh, was we changed the way that they uh, did calls to action. MQLs previously, and that's marketing qualified leads, those languishing in the pipeline people, converted to demo trial at 2.5 to 5%, depending on the period. Here's what we did, though. So this is like the lead magnet form. Um, you don't need to read it all, but basically it just says, are you looking to scale your AUM assets under management by 5 to 15%? Very pain point focused. Yeah, I want to do that. Okay, well, here's seven critical financial mistakes to avoid when doing that. Great, that sounds like something I need to know. Here's my email address, here's my job title. Most people deliver at that point just a PDF in a window, uh, a browser window. It's the wrong move. It's a wasted opportunity. Don't do it. Instead, offer them a next useful step. So what we did is we said, this guide is going to arrive in your inbox in five minutes. You just gave us your email address. We'll send it to you. You can go away if you want. No problem. On the other hand, if you are actually looking for a simpler way to scale your assets under management, here's a quick video. And by the way, that demo video, it's corresponding to the five-minute wait for the PDF to arrive. That's a kind of an important part of that. You can watch this video, and then sure, why don't you just take a trial? Like, it's free, you don't have to do anything, you just do it if you want. You don't have to, we'll continue to market to you, we've got your email address now. But there it is, it's right there. If you wanna do it, those are the pain points and the benefits. Uh, five to 10% of people became trials. This is a significant improvement, if you think about the volume there as well that you might drive through paid media. If you could go from 2.5, to five to 10, right? So uh, then we're on to compressed time. Uh, so how often are you using the same marketing channels that you use to acquire right fit leads to continue marketing to them once you have them as a trial user or SQL in your pipeline? Basically, once somebody has said, I'm ready for marketing, and maybe they signed up for a free trial, do you continue marketing to them? you shouldn't just be checking in on prospects. Don't just go like, hey, uh, you wanna do this now, right? Continue to market to these people. They've said that they have a problem that you can solve. They've signed up for your trials, they've signed up for your demos. Your marketing should be always on, basically working for you while you're asleep. That's the dream, right? We can get revenue while we're sleeping. So we call this thing the boomerang method. This is one way that you can do this. Um, and it's basically, uh, you guys are familiar with remarketing, where basically you put a pixel on your website, then you use ad networks to retarget people, right? There's some challenges with that. Let's not talk about that right now. But um, the tired way of doing this is basically go, hey, if anyone visits my website, I'm just gonna retarget them with ads, wherever they are on the internet. It's, it doesn't work because it's undifferentiated, you're targeting everyone with the same message, there's no, there's no finesse to that. The wired way to do this is to go, okay, here are the high, uh, the high value interactions that a person can have on my website. View my pricing, look at the demo request page, or interact with an ad. There's other ones, your, your mileage may vary. You pixel those people and then they see we're targeting ads. The real kicker is that there's a better way to do this. Again, this is what we call the boomerang method. So basically, now we go, okay, if you visit a high intent pre-acquisition page, so you get pixeled, you see retargeting acquisition offer, that's very specific to what you're feeling. If you visit in-app pages because you've signed up for a trial but you haven't converted, we're gonna pixel you and put you in a different audience. Then you're gonna see a retargeting demo offer. So you're gonna have someone reach out to you if you want them to. If you're a customer but you haven't activated, you're gonna get a customer success offer, right? Um, and then if you interact with an ad, you're just gonna see the plain old uh, retargeting ads. But doing this allows you to make the most of what you already have. These people are waiting to convert. They're in your pipeline. Don't let them languish. And by the way, retargeting is an absolutely cheap version of 
paid marketing, right? Just cold ads. Retargeting is significantly cheaper. All right, there was a heap of information there, and I'm almost done. But the question here is, like, what do you do with this? You get this big old diagram. How do you prioritize these actions? Well, hopefully, you were making scores throughout. If you're not, you can do it later. Because here's what we do. We tally up the score for each section and divide by three. It gives you the average. You're smart people. <laughs> you know this. Uh, but it gives you the average for each section. Attract, engage, convert. Okay? Now, the first thing that you can do, and really the only thing that's going to really drive things, is focus on the lowest scoring section. That's classic management scorecard theory. The thing, though, to do is then to break it out and go, OK, prioritize your activity by the lowest scores within that section. You have limited resources. Everyone does. How do you make the most of that time? Prioritize your activity by the lowest scores. I'm going to drop a link to the SAS scalability score, which we all just did, hopefully, in the microconf channel so you can use it with your team. And if you want to get the first chapter of the book that we've written, you just go to predictablegrowth.com, uh, and you can download it now. Guys, this has been great. Thank you so much. I hope it's been useful. Uh, show of hands, useful, not useful? Useful. All right. <laughs> Thank you. At very close to the beginning, you talked about um, this statement, many, um, target market, pain points, so on, and our competitors do. It's the competitors part that gets me. We have like 50, 100 competitors. How do I find which competitors I should actually care about and focus on when I'm putting these type, this type of messaging together? Yeah, I think um, there's two parts to this. The first part is really understanding what's the, what are the categories within that market of competitors. I, I would be surprised if you have 100 competitors who are doing all exactly the same thing as you. You may want to think about whether you can differentiate in some way, product-wise, at that point. But there are probably several subcategories, right? So understanding which one you're actually speaking to, that can, that can help you in the first place by basically saying, look, we're batching competitor messaging into different competitor types. The second thing, though, is uh, how do you discover which one to actually address? Like, let's, you're not going to create 100 competitor pages. You're probably going to create two or three. The real thing that you should do is basically uh, look at the data um, in, your, uh, in your CRM. Like, what did, your best, um, what did your best fit prospects do previously? Um, you can look at uh, you can look at the kind of the market as a whole and go okay these are the people we're actually probably losing business to even if you haven't asked directly you you probably got a gut feel uh, and then the third thing is obviously going back to sales calls uh, or demos or trials or whatever you've done uh, and basically saying okay these are the people that were mentioned during the process just. Do a tally. Don't overthink it at this point. Um, do a tally and just prioritize a couple of those competitors to address. Um, and if you've got case studies uh, or just even testimonials of people who've had success after switching, again, a great way to think about this because that's believable stuff that you can, sh you can show off. Thank you very much, everyone. Please give a big round of applause. Thank you.